right, I think we're going to get started here. So welcome everyone to the Miracle of Living Lecture Series. Uh, I am Dr. Tracy Burke. I work as a hospitalist and I am the current uh, Chief of Medicine at Torrance Memorial Medical Center and I will be the moderator this evening. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the eye and eye health. And eyesight is one of our most important senses because your eyes allow you to connect with your surroundings, keep you safe, and help you remain mentally sharp. So we are going to have three presenters tonight on this topic and time afterwards for questions. So hold all your questions till after the presentations. Um, we have attendees both live in the audience here and online. For those online, questions may be placed in the chat, and for those in the live audience, questions may be written down. And after the presentations, we will have a short break of just a few minutes to collect all the questions and then go through a Q&A with our presenters. Um, so uh, the other thing, other housekeeping rules, um, just if you could silence your phones, please, during the presentations. So we will get on with it. Um, first, our first presenter is Dr. Damian Goldberg. Uh, Dr. Goldberg currently is a board certified ophthalmologist and a managing partner at Wolstan and Goldberg Eye Associates. Dr. Goldberg is, South, is a South Bay native and obtained a Bachelor of Science degree at Emory University in Georgia before attending Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. He then completed an ophthalmology residency at Georgetown Washington Hospital Center, followed by a fellowship in cornea, cataract, and external disease at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Dr. Goldberg currently performs routine eye exams, as well as laser vision correction surgery, refractive cataract surgery, and new techniques in corneal surgery and microinvasive glaucoma surgery. Dr. Goldberg presently serves as chairman of ophthalmology at Torrance Memorial and serves on other committees at the hospital as well. So first up, we will have Dr. Goldberg present. Thank you, Tracy, for such a warm welcome. And uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Really appreciate it. Uh, so I'm one of the anterior segment or front of the eye uh, surgeons in the South Bay area, affiliated here with Torrance. And I'm gonna just kind of lightly touch a little bit on some of the newer techniques of cataract surgery. And then after my talk, we're gonna hear from the great Dr. Gasparini and uh, Hannah, our nutritionist, and then happy to answer any questions uh, from our panel later. So let's talk a little bit about cataract surgery. Uh, first, let me introduce our group. This is myself, uh, Dr. Walston in the middle and our other surgeons and doctors with our group. You have Dr. Kubian on the left, Dr. Fan um, between him and uh, Dr. Walston in the middle. And that's Cindy Wild, one of our optometrists, myself and missing from the pictures is one of our other op optometrists, Dr. Isabel Duong. So last year, about 3.7 million cataracts were, surgeries were performed in the US. This is now the most common surgical procedure done in the uh, 50 states. It speaks very high to the safety and efficacy of the procedure. The current technique takes anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes and is done with a handheld probe called the FACO emulsification uh, probe. And what it is is a, a device that kind of looks like a pencil. And we slip it through a small 2.4 millimeter incision. And it allows us to use ultrasound to kind of scoop out the old cloudy lens that is very common that we develop in humans in the, our 70s and 80s. Some people get it younger, but that's usually the time period. And once this lens is removed, there's a leftover capsule that acts as a scaffolding and it allows us to slip in implants. And there's a great variety of different types, and I'll show you some of them. And an implant slips in there. It's called an IOL for intraocular lens. And this technique allows us to restore vision uh, for those who have cataracts. As I mentioned, 
there's many different types of lenses available now. And here's just an array of five. There's actually closer to 1520 different type. But these are the five I probably use the most. And there's some that can restore vision for just distance or just reading. And there's some now that allow you multiple zones of vision. There really are three zones of vision. There's distance vision, intermediate vision, which is like computer range or laptop range, and then reading, which is like looking at a book or looking at a phone or eating. So these trifocal lenses, like the panoptic and the synergy, are lenses that give you back these three zones. Sometimes these are amazing and they can really reestablish full range. Sometimes these are contraindicated in certain eyes because of other medical conditions. For patients who still want full range vision, we now have safer lenses that can work with some pre-existing diseases. And they're typically in the category of extended depth of field. And that's the Symphony and the Vividi. I tend to use these two more, but I'll use all the different technologies. So this is a little bit about the lenses. Now, fortunately, most people come into my office and they just assume outcomes are amazing and we can do just about anything these days. And that's probably thanks to the advertising you hear on the radio uh, for LASIK surgery. And from really the outcomes our brothers and sisters who do laser surgery have been able to perform and achieve. But the reality is cataract surgery is about 10 times more complicated and a lot more can happen during the procedure. So it's obviously super important the surgeon has confidence when they're doing the surgery. But fortunately, some new developments have happened in the last 10 or 20 years in surgery that allow us to now almost achieve near outcomes similar to laser correction. So funny enough, I just show this to give you a uh, you know, comparison, LASIK has actually been done since the early 90s. And at first, when LASIK happened, people were only getting 2040 vision outcomes. But now everyone gets 2020, almost 95, 98% of the time. Cataract surgery has been about 2040 vision, really, till about almost 2004. It really wasn't until these new implants came out and a new technique where we can use laser during cataract surgery came out to allow us this precision. And that's what I was going to kind of show you and talk to you about. So we can do the cataract surgery with the handheld probe, and it does work, but this outcome only gets us 20, 40, 78 percent of the time. That's not bad, but it's not great. The advent of laser surgery when we do cataract surgery allows us to now get up to 92, almost 90% accuracy. And the question is, why do, how are we able to do this? Well, here's kind of some pictures of handheld surgery. I have to make a perfect circle opening. You can see that's not the greatest circle. I have to use that probe to kind of remove the cataract. And I have to hope that the lens goes in the exact spot that I put it in. There is a calculus formula we use when we scan your eye for cataract surgery to help us sort of best guess the lens power that we should choose. And this is based on what's called the ELP or the effective lens position. So based on the curve of your eye and the length of your eye, we assume that your lens is going to sit right in this spot perfectly. And that will allow us to achieve the vision you want. But if the surgery doesn't go just right, that lens can shift forward, that lens can shift backwards, that lens could tilt. So there's all these little minor things that can happen that can affect the outcome. Laser surgery really allows us to improve these um, minor changes that can happen. And it does it through these four steps. We can, for the first time, with accuracy and precision, make a perfect circle or capsulotomy every time. And I'm going to show you a slide of somebody who did it by hand eight times in the laser, and you're going to tell me which one you think is better. Then the laser can really perfectly break the cataract up into little pieces. 
Some eyes are oval shaped and shaped like a football. They may have what's called astigmatism. The laser can relax this astigmatism through a technique called relaxing incisions. And last off, the laser can really make a real beautiful three-plane incision in the cornea, which allows it to seal well. So let's first talk about the capsulotomy. Let's take a look at this picture. Which side do you think was done by hand and which side was done by the computer? <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. We're pretty, we're pretty confident as surgeons, but when you see this, you can really see the difference. So if I can make this perfect circle every time, that means when I put the lens in, I'm more likely to be able to get it in the right position in the capsule. And that's crucial for the ELP, that, that numerical value we were talking about earlier. Then also, let's talk about lens fragmentation. Well, so now we get the scan of your lens prior to surgery, and we're able to buffer it and just focus the highest part of the energy on the highest part of the cataract so that we don't risk the other parts of the uh, anatomy called the capsule. And so what we do is we put the safety barrier and we can really focus on breaking the hard part up with more energy and leaving the soft part for a different removal technique called um, IA. The fragmentation also allows us to use a lot less energy. So we know when we do cataract surgery the old way, the reality is we're hurting the eye and knocking out about eight or 10% of the cells that were in there. With laser surgery, we can reduce that by about 40, 50%. So we're only knocking out about 5% of the cells. So that's been a nice advent in helping us improve the cornea, which is the front part of the eye, the um, other anatomy and less damage to the retina. Then last off, we can really do these limbal relaxing incisions and corneal incisions. And that allows us just greater um, uh, closure and uh, fixing uh, aspects of the astigmatism. So here's a couple models on the market right now of the different lasers out there. Um, in the South Bay, we primarily have Alcon technology and that's the lasers we've used. I've used all of them, they're all excellent and they all deliver pretty uh, similar results. So the funny thing is, I'm telling you all about this new technology, but many of you may have thought that's how we did it anyways. So I'm just glad I can finally meet your expectations uh, because most of us do believe that all things we do in the eye are with lasers. But at the end of the day, patients don't really care that much about how I'm gonna get you there. They just want good outcomes, fast recovery, and don't want a second surgery. And that's really one of the great things about the uh, femto second laser with cataract surgery. It's helped me really meet these goals and uh, mitigate some of the um, secondary surgeries needed. Now, what other technology is out there? Well, excitingly enough, I've talked a little bit about some of the fixed implants that we can put in the eye. You may have seen, I recently uh, had an article written with Torrance Memorial about a new technology called a flexible lens or a light adjustable lens. So what came out about three years ago when we incorporated in our office about a year ago is these new implants called light adjustable lenses. And what's so special and unique about these is the lens can be inputted in the eye after the surgery. We let the body heal. And you remember how I was talking about that ELP, that effective lens position? Now I'm not so worried about it because if the lens does shift or the lens moves, I have a machine in my office that I can just shine a light on this implant and I can change the center part. I can make it more fat or more thin and account for the shift that's happened in your eye. So for the first time, we're getting even better than 90% accuracy with um, meeting our endpoints for uh, achieving vision. The light treatments are usually done about 17 days after the surgery. And once the first light treatment's been done, the second one can be done three days later. I usually wait about a week because that works best for people's schedules. But if they really want to go, we can do all their light adjustments within just a few weeks. So for the first time, we can put lenses in your eye and you can kind of test drive your vision. 
You can see if you like your eye set for distance, if you're not really happy with it, not a problem. I shine a light on your eye and we make you better for intermediate or better for reading. So it gives you more control and it gives us more flexibility. So this really helps me reach out to more patients and I think meet more people's uh, goals and interests. Um, and the other thing is some of those other lenses that were getting people full range vision, there were certain trade-offs. They were losing a little contrast or they were noticing rings. Don't get any of that with this type of technology. So I got a little video here, if I can get it to play, that kind of shows you a little bit of how the light treatment's done. I don't know if, Mitch, we may need your help on this. Can you play that in that box back there? You might be able to show me how to do this. No. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe. Okay. It was a video. I don't know if we can. Thanks for running over. Okay. All right. Well, don't worry about that. Basically, here's the pictures basically showing you the light shined on the implant. This is made out of material called macromer. And after the wave frequency hits the implant, it forms these uh, connections, which causes fluid to swell and follow it. And so you're able to change the uh, width of the center part of the lens to make it fatter or thinner, depending what your requirements are. I can also change the lens to become more football shaped and manage astigmatism. So that's been a really nice, neat, cool um, change. We actually participated in the clinical trials uh, about eight, 10 years ago. So it's amazing and it's been fun to watch this finally develop and come to market. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it and thank for your attention. And we're gonna go on to the next part and then I'd be happy to answer any questions on the panel. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Julie Gasparini. Dr. Gasparini is a board certified ophthalmologist specializing in the medical and surgical treatment of diseases of the retina and vitreous. She grew up in the rural Upper Peninsula of Michigan and received her Bachelor of Science degree in physiology summa cum laude from Michigan State University Honors College. Um, she attended uh, Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan, where she was awarded her medical degree and completed an internship in internal medicine. Dr. Gasparini then went on to complete residency training in ophthalmology at the Kresge Eye Institute at Wayne State University, where she was elected co-chief resident. She completed a two-year vitreo retinal surgery fellowship at the prestigious Doheny Eye Institute at University of Southern California. After completing her fellowship training, Dr. Gasparini joined, joined the South Coast Retina Center. She is the principal investigator for clinical trials in the research department. Dr. Gasparini is a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Society of Retina Specialists. So next up is Dr. Gasparini. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's so nice to be back in the community doing these lectures again after um, COVID. So it's really nice to be in person here. Um, I am part of the South Coast Retina Center, and we have an office in Torrance, and I've been able to take care of patients in the Torrance area for the last 15 years. And our practice is six retina subspecialists specializing in retinal conditions that impact the eye, which is the back of the eye. And we treat a lot of patients in our office with injection therapy for conditions like diabetic macular edema, which we're gonna talk about today, macular degeneration and vein occlusions. 
and we do surgery in the operating room for retinal diseases, things like retinal detachments and diabetic retinopathy and macular holes and puckers are just some of the common surgeries that we do. And in fact, I was here this morning operating at the Torrance Memorial's wonderful outpatient uh, surgery center. So this is my second time in the, on the campus today. So I'm excited to talk to you about diabetic retinopathy because I see so many patients with this condition and vision is so important. So let's get into the lecture. So first of all, what is diabetes? Diabetes is a disease that affects the body's ability to produce or use insulin effectively to control our blood sugar or glucose levels. And too much glucose in the blood for a long time can damage many parts of the body. Diabetes can damage many parts of the body, such as the heart, kidneys, and blood vessels. And it can damage small blood vessels in the eye as well. And even if your diabetes is well controlled, it can impact your regular eye care and eye health. And this illustration is a, to show all of the different parts of the body that are impacted from, di from diabetes diabetes. And we're going to focus today on the ocular complications that you see at the bottom of this circle. And I'm mainly going to be talking about diabetic retinopathy because that tends to be the most visually uh, disabling part of the disease. But it can also impact things like cataracts and high blood sugars can impact the blood sugars and sugars in the eye and cause the lens of the eye to become cloudy and require more early cataract surgery. And fortunately, we have a lot of great options now, like Dr. Goldberg just explained, to remove that cloudy lens from the eye. Also, glaucoma can impact the eye. And in glaucoma, the chances of getting a glaucoma are doubled when you have diabetes, and that's a disease that can impact the optic nerve and cause loss of peripheral vision. But today we're mainly going to be caught talking about diabetic retinopathy. So how do we prevent diabetic retinopathy? And I think the biggest take home for this talk is the importance of screening diabetic eye exams. Because although we know diabetes can cause blindness, I am very encouraged to tell everybody today that 90% of vision loss from diabetes can be prevented. It's preventable. And early detection is key. And that's why our annual eye exams are critical even before there are signs of vision loss. And studies show that 60% of patients are not getting their regular diabetic eye exams, which is really a staggering number. And that's a lot of times why we see those more visually disabling complications that are preventable, because it's really important to detect eye disease early, and we have a lot of great treatments available that we did not have in the past. And so what is involved in a diabetic eye exam? Well, to see the back of the eye or the retina, it's important to dilate the pupil. So you'll have drops put in your eye so that we can look at the back of the eye with special lenses. And we'll do lots of imaging tests. And we'll take fundus photography to look at the back of the eye, which is what you see in this picture here. We do these fancy images called OCT or optical coherence tomography that takes a slice of the retina. So this scan is of the macula, which is the most sensitive part of your retina for vision. 
And these, my patients become very savvy with reading these tests. When I walk in the room, they already say, oh, doc, I don't need a shot today, or I do. My patients become very savvy at reading these tests. And the last test we do for diabetes is called a fluorescein angiogram. And that's this test here. And we inject a little bit of vegetable-based dye in the arm of the patient. And we, that dye goes through the body and we take pictures and look at the blood vessels in the back of the eye. This is one of the few parts of the body that we actually can see the vascular damage directly that is caused by diabetes. So what is diabetic retinopathy? So diabetic retinopathy occurs when blood vessels in the retina swell, they can leak fluid, or they can close off completely. These are pictures of what a, oops, what a, let me go back here. This is a picture of a normal, healthy looking retina. Here, this doesn't look so healthy. You don't need to be a doctor to know that that doesn't look very good. People who have diabetes or poor blood sugar control are at higher risk of diabetic retinopathy. And that risk increases the longer that someone has diabetes. And that's why those diabetic screening exams are so important to detect early disease and to help patients get early treatment. So what are the types of diabetic retinopathy? So there is an earlier type of disease called non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and that's what you see in this picture. So again, this is a normal retina. In non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, patients can have very good vision with this stage of the disease, and many diabetics have some diabetic retinopathy. The longer you have diabetes, the longer you'll have the chances of having diabetic retinopathy, but patients may just have very mild um, or no symptoms with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. There's also a more severe type of retinopathy called proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And this is more advanced disease that can cause more visually disabling eye disease. And it can cause these abnormal blood vessels that bleed and cause hemorrhage in the retina. And these patients may see blind spots or blurry spots in their vision as well. And the most common diabetic retinopathy that I treat in my office is called diabetic macular edema. In diabetic macular edema, we can see with very early non-proliferative disease, and we can also see it with much more advanced diabetic retinopathy. And in diabetic macular edema, those little vessels in the back of the eye become damaged from the chronic high blood sugar levels, and those vessels become leaky. And they start leaking fluid into the macula or that central portion of our retina that is so critical for our vision. And they leak fluid into the retina, and they can also leak these little yellow crystalline lipid deposits that also can impact vision. So the patients that get more advanced or proliferative diabetic retinopathy will get those vessels I was talking about called neovascularization, where you get these abnormal vessels growing on the surface of the retina. And they're very fragile and they can bleed and they can bleed into what's called the vitreous cavity. So I like to use the analogy of a, of a room and the retina is like the wallpaper in a room and the gel of the eye or the vitreous fills the room and the retina that when the vessels are on the surface of the retina, they can bleed into the vitreous cavity. If there's a little bit of blood, you may see some dark blurry spots in your vision. But if it bleeds a lot, you can't really see the back of the eye and patients will, will have very poor vision at this stage. And sometimes those vessels can start creating scar tissue. And this is some scar tissue here. 
And if you imagine scar tissue on that wallpaper, it can contract and pull the wallpaper off the wall or pull the retina from the eye wall called a traction retinal detachment. So these are some more of the serious diseases, all again, which can be preventable. And the earlier we catch them, the easier they are to treat to help restore or improve vision. So what are the symptoms of diabetic retinopathy? So some patients may just have some mild blurred vision. Even in patients that are diabetic without retinopathy can have blurry vision, especially when their blood sugars are fluctuating because it can change the prescription in the eye. And that's why it's so important <clears throat> when you get your glasses to make sure the blood sugars are well controlled because that can impact your prescription in the eye. Sometimes people, if they get bleeding in the eye, may notice some dark spots or floaters or even blind spots where that blood is obscuring the vision from the retina. And those blood, little leaky blood vessels that we were talking about, sometimes they can close off altogether and cause ischemia or a poor blood flow to the central or peripheral retina. And that can cause some poor night vision because that's where the photoreceptors are that impact our night vision. So all of these can be very vague types of symptoms that people can have with diabetic retinopathy or more severe um, vision loss when the complications are more advanced. So what can we do? Prevention in, is so much easier than treatment. So prevention is key. And again, it, we can decrease the chances of vision loss with treatment of your diabetes. So you're gonna to wanna to control blood sugars and blood pressure, which can help stop vision loss. Follow your diet, the nutritionist has recommended, and we'll hear more about that shortly. Sometimes even just controlling the blood sugars can improve vision on its own. So controlling your blood pressure can help keep those blood vessels healthy in the eye. So blood pressure control is really important. And getting those annual diabetic eye exams and seeing your ophthalmologist for those diabetic exams are very important to detect disease. And if patients notice changes in vision to follow up with their doctors so treatment can be started to prevent vision loss. So what if you need treatment and what are the treatments that we can offer patients? Well, the most common treatment we do in our office is called intravitreal injections. So that's a, whoops, sorry about that. That's a picture here of the eye. When those leaky vessels in the back of the eye cause that swelling or that diabetic macular edema, there's treatments called anti-VEGF agents that we can inject in the eye to help suppress that leakage to clear the fluid from the retina to try to improve and prevent further loss of vision. And you may hear some of these injections being advertised, names like Avastin and Lucentis and Ilea and Fabismo are the four injectable medications that we use very commonly. Sometimes we inject steroids in the eye. And a lot of patients get really scared. How can I get an injection in my eye? But the thought is with most things is much worse than the reality. And we numb up the eye with a little bit of lidocaine gel. We put betadine in the eye to, per, to decrease the risk of infection and the patients feel a little pinch. When I have patients that come into the office for the first time and they say, oh my gosh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. I try to do their treatment that day or I find that they, they will be so worried and we do the treatment and they say, that's it, you're done? And I said, yes, that's it. <laughs> so it, the thought can be much worse than the reality. And these medications have really revolutionized in the way we've treated so many um, ocular conditions. And we're, there's so many different clinical trials that are available that we participate in that are looking for longer acting agents. 
And we have to inject this eye usually at least a year for diabetic macular edema every month. So it requires chronic injection therapy, but typically we can stop treatment um, over time and monitor for recurrence. The other type of treatment is laser. So we still do laser. Laser is a very old treatment for diabetes. And the most common reason to do laser is for that advanced or proliferative disease that causes that leaky vessels to close off and cause a poor blood flow. And we do a combination of injections and laser treatment to those treat those. You can see all the white spots on the retina. So we're treating that ischemic retina to help get those vessels to regress and go away and stay away. But what if somebody has much more advanced disease and they have that blood that is obscuring the retina and obscuring their vision, or they have that scar tissue that causes attraction, retinal detachment? Then we do what's called a vitrectomy surgery in the operating room. So here's a picture of the eyeball, and this is the type of surgery I was doing this morning. And so we make three little ports and incisions in the eye, and we put this fluid or cannula in the eye to help maintain the eye pressure. And then we have to see in the eye. So we use a little light pipe so it illuminates the eye and we can see and we operate under a microscope. And then we use an instrument called a vitrector. And it's kind of like a little vacuum and it can suck away that blood that's in the back of the eye. And we can remove uh, scar tissue from the retina. And sometimes we put gas or oil in the eye to help keep the retina attached. And believe it or not, we do this usually under a local anesthesia. We give you a numbing block around the eye. It's done in a twilight anesthesia for the majority um, of patients. And this uh, procedure has been available for decades, but the advancements in instrumentation and technologies just from when I started my training have really improved patient outcomes. We're able to operate uh, earlier on patients, and there's still technologic advancements going on for vitrectomy surgery. So we do have a lot of treatments for patients, for diabetic retinopathy. We can prevent disease. Most disease is preventable. People do not need to go blind for diabetes. And even with advanced stages of the disease, there are treatment options um, available. And it's really nice to be able to offer and help these patients. I sometimes have patients come in with bleeding in both eyes. They can't see anything and we can you know, restore their, their vision, which um, is really a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of. So uh, I'm all done with my part of the talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions as part of the panel. I know the online audience had a group of questions and I hope I answered most of those already in the talk. <laughs> and we're going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. All right, great. And again, uh, save your questions for the end. I'm sure you have a lot after that talk. Um, okay, so next up, uh, we are going to talk about nutrition and risk for eye disease. Uh, Hannah Bodenhammer is a registered dietitian and member of Torrance Memorial's clinical dietitian team recently acclaimed as South Bay's best nutritionist team in 2023. Uh, she obtained her master's in nutrition and food systems from the University of Southern Mississippi and Bachelor of Nutrition and Dietetics from California State University, Long Beach. She provides nutrition care in both inpatient and outpatient settings and most recently began specializing in adult weight management and bariatrics. Hannah aims to positively impact all South Bay residents through meaningful nutrition, education, and transformative interventions. Join her as she explores the latest nutrition research, delving into the crucial role of nutrition in eye health. So let's welcome Hannah.
Great. Good evening, everybody. My name is Hannah. Thank you, Dr. Berkey, for the lovely introduction. And thank you, Mary Ford, for inviting me to be a featured speaker this evening. Today, we will be discussing the role of nutrition and eye health. Age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts, and diabetic retinopathy are among the leading causes of vision loss worldwide. Over 250 million worldwide are affected by vision loss. This number is expected to double by 2050 due to the rapidly aging population. While the causes of age-related eye diseases are complex and multifactorial, Certain conditions have been identified by researchers as common risk factors amongst the different age-related eye diseases. This has prompted many researchers to explore potential strategies for eye disease prevention, modifiable risk factors, and the role of different nutrients in the eye. While much is still unknown about the causes for age-related eye disease, Researchers attribute risk for age-related eye disease to certain conditions, such as ocular risk factors, lifestyle nutrition, medical risk factors, age, genetics, and other risk factors. Medical risk factors include the intake of certain medications, as well as chronic diseases. Lifestyle factors include smoking, nutrition and diet, obesity, alcohol consumption, fat physical activity or lack thereof, and sunlight exposure. These lifestyle factors are highly modifiable and should be considered when trying to manage one's risk for age-related eye disease. <clears throat> As mentioned previously, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, aging, and genetics are responsible for microvascular complications within the retina, as well as other organs within the body. These microvascular com complications are commonly observed in different age-related eye diseases, including age-related macular degeneration. Poor control of blood sugar, cholesterol, and blood pressure can increase oxidative damage within these microvessels and inflict harmful changes to the vessels within the eye. These changes are closely correlated with diabetic retinopathy, cataract, glaucoma, and age-related macular degeneration. The management of chronic diseases through healthful diet and lifestyle habits, as well as medical therapies, can aid in the prevention or control of one's risk for developing age-related eye disease, as well as other chronic diseases associated with these complications. One can practice a balanced diet rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, healthy fats, while incorporating frequent exercise and mitigating our sedentary patterns that is found in most of the American lifestyle this day. Countless publications highlight the involvement of various nutrients in age-related eye diseases. But today we will be discussing the most exhaustively studied nutrients and their role in age-related eye disease. Oxidative stress is thought to play a key role in age-related eye disease. Oxidative stress occurs with an imbalance of free radicals in antioxidant activity, causing damage to healthy molecules and cells. <clears throat> Now the eyes are more susceptible to oxidative damage than any other organ within the body because their high consumption of oxygen, high concentration of polyunsaturated fatty acids, exposure constantly to visible light, as well as other exogenous oxi oxidative stressors. Antioxidants, a hot topic in nutrition today are molecules that neutralize these free radicals and help control the oxidative damage inflicted on these healthy molecules. Hundreds, if not thousands of different molecules qualify as antioxidants. Some are made by the body and some are required through dietary sources. We will not be covering all hundreds of these different molecules and today we'll be focused, focusing on the nutrients most highlighted in recent research. 
Vitamin A is not only a powerful antioxidant, but also a key molecule in the visual cycle. Vitamin A has a responsibility in the um, phototransduction where we are able to translate photons into electrical signals within the brain for sight perception. Adequate intake is required for good eye health. However, excessive vitamin A intake has been shown to increase our risk for eye disease. Vitamin A can build up in toxic, toxic amounts within the body, causing a condition called hypervitaminosis, which can have some serious side effects as well as increase our risk. On the other hand, vitamin A deficiency can affect the rods and cones within the eyes, furthering the progression and risk for eye disease. Severe deficiencies can lead to permanent damage of photoreceptors and cause impaired vision. Therefore, in clinical practice, vitamin A supplementation is only recommended in the setting of deficiency rather than prevention. It is good practice to try to get a vitamin A through a well-balanced diet with a variety of vitamins and minerals. Because of the concern for toxicity, it's important to talk to your medical provider before starting any vitamin A supplementations and focus on those food sources, which include liver, fish, eggs, dairy, other types of meats, and pro-vitamin A carotenoids, which we will cover in the next slide. Oops, and a little bit later on. Vitamin C is another potent antioxidant nutrient which can act to really help protect the eyes. It is found in high concentration within the eye and acts as a natural protection from UV light and oxidative stress. Research does show that vitamin C concentrations can decrease with age, which is a proposed mechanism for some development of age-related eye diseases. However, clinical trials do show or do lack to show convincing evidence of vitamin C supplementation for the prevention of certain eye diseases. Several global studies identify dietary intake of vitamin C as a safe intervention for mitigating one's risk for developing eye disease. Foods rich in vitamin C include citrus fruits, tomatoes, potatoes, bell peppers, kiwi fruit, as well as broccoli and other leafy greens. All right, our carotenoids, which include beta carotene, lutein, zeaxanthin, as well as other nutrients. Carotenoids are a class of nutrients which also act as powerful antioxidants and have a hand in inflammation, acting as inflammatory modulators and are popular subjects of research proposed to have benefits in both eye health, the prevention of chronic diseases, and even in cancer research. Some carotenoids, such as beta carotene, act as pro-vitamin A molecules, meaning under certain conditions, the body can use these molecules to create vitamin A. Many studies have slowed the, many studies involving beta carotene have showed slowed progression from intermediate macular degeneration to advanced macular degeneration. Namely, in the age-related eye disease study, or also known as ARIDS. However, the ARIDS study secondary evaluations did show a higher correlation between vitamin, sorry, beta carotene supplementation with the development of lung cancer in those who smoke. For that reason, they have reformulated the ARIDS supplementation formulation without beta carotene and replaced it with lutein and zeaxanthin. This shift on to different carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin, also have positive outcomes in terms of progression of intermediate to advanced age-related macular degeneration. Lutein and zeaxanthin are embedded in the lipid bilayer, bilayer within the retinal membrane and can be found within the lens. This provides a prime location for these powerful antioxidants to help quench free radicals and help protect the eye. Additionally, lutein and zeaxanthin can increase macular pigment, which is inversely associated with the development of age-related macular degeneration. 
Studies show that increased circulating lutein and zeaxanthin from increased dietary intake are associated with reduced risk of eye disease. However, other studies show that zeaxanthin and lutein supplementation are only effective when combined with other vitamins and minerals, which will be discussed later. Vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin with proposed positive correlation with eye health through its role in regulating inflammatory cytokines, cell signaling pathways, and potent antioxidant qualities as well. Studies show that vitamin E deficiency may cause irreversible changes to the retina structure and function, as well as increased risk for age-related macular degeneration. Many studies point to the positive influence of increased vitamin E intake through diet on the reduction in age-related eye disease progression. Vitamin E supplementation is a common practice in medical offices because of its proposed benefit to general health. However, some literature does warn about the potential side effect of vitamin E supplementation. A good practice would be to practice a diet rich in vitamin E, including foods such as plant oils, almonds, peanuts, sunflower seeds, leafy greens, pumpkin, red bell pepper, asparagus, mango, and avocado. A bit more controversial is omega-3 fatty acids. So moving along from the antioxidant category, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are widely celebrated for their positive role in heart health. These fatty acids are a structural component within cellular membranes retinal photoreceptors, and the brain. Omega-3 fatty acids can help regulate inflammation, enhance tear production, and protect against some oxidative stressors, which may have a positive role within age-related eye disease. They are considered essential because they must be obtained from diet, meaning we lack the enzyme needed to create these molecules. Several studies evaluate the impact of omega-3 fatty acids on the prevention and treatment of eye disease. However, research does turn out to be quite disappointing. Some studies show a positive correlation. However, many studies show no positive effect. Due to their role in heart health, as well as the prevention of other chronic diseases and general health, a good practice could be focusing on dietary intake versus supplementation. Food sources of omega-3 include fatty fish, such as salmon, tuna, mackerel, sardines, as well as avocados, nuts and seeds, and plant oils. Some minerals named in eye-related research are zinc, <clears throat> which does display some powerful antioxidant properties as well. Zinc is a mineral widely used for its potential benefit in immune health and wound healing. Zinc studies show high concentrations within the retina and specifically within areas of the retina most affected by age-related macular degeneration. Other studies show with age that the zinc concentrations within the macula do decrease, which can allude to its potential role in the progression of age-related eye diseases. Zinc is also an anti-inflammatory agent which research shows or suggests that may have an impact on the chronic low levels of inflammation within the macula and in the eye, which can progress age-related eye diseases. Studies acknowledge that the benefit of zinc supplementation only occurs with other vitamins, such as mentioned in the ARED study, which I will discuss later on. Zinc supplementation alone has little to no benefit and may have negative effects as it can cause copper deficiency as they compete for uh, intake within the gastrointestinal system. Now this can cause neurological disorders as well as anemia, so long-term supplementation of zinc is not widely recommended. Definitely discuss with your doctor before practicing this. Some food sources of zinc are mentioned here, including meat, seafood, beans, and lentils, nuts and seeds, whole grains, dairy, avocado, green peas, spinach, and mushroom. Our last mineral mentioned today is selenium, which is a trace mineral 
needed for many enzymatic pathways within the body. Glutathione peroxidase is a major antioxidant enzyme within the body, which relies on selenium for its function. Glutathione per peroxidase helps to protect lipids found in the cellular membranes, especially those lipids within the eye. Research focusing on selenium is also inconclusive, showing no clinical recommendation for the supplementation of selenium, but potential research is promising for discovering its role in eye health. So the AREDS-2 study, the age-related eye disease studies, one and two, provided pivotal findings for the role of nutrition in eye health. These studies focused on a special formulation of vitamins and minerals, which were applied to a population group of 4,000 participants over the course of five years. As mentioned previously, the first formulation included beta carotene, <clears throat> which was supplemented out for lutein and zeaxanthin in secondary trials over 10 years later. Both studies show positive outcomes in terms of age-related eye disease and can show that slowed progression from intermediate to advanced age-related macular degeneration. The greatest finding of this study is that those with intermediate eye disease or age-related macular degeneration can lower their risk about 25% to advanced disease over the course of five years. This is significant as age-related macular degeneration is growing rapidly amongst the population. Now, other in this study that was shown, this study did not show any benefit to omega-3 supplementation. The study did not show any benefit to those looking to prevent the onset of macular degeneration, only in those who already have macular degeneration and are looking to slow their progression of their disease. Lastly, what can we do to help prevent the onset of age-related macular degeneration if many of the studies are not showing benefit to individual supplementation of vitamins and minerals? Is to focus on our dietary intake of vitamins and minerals. So this will require a diet with a wide variety of different healthy fats, lean proteins, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. One diet that is commonly focused on in nutrition research is the Mediterranean diet. <clears throat> the Mediterranean diet has had profound positive benefits in terms of reduction for, of risk for chronic disease, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, as well as certain types of cancers and neurological diseases. This diet is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, as well as omega-6 fatty acids, as well as vitamins and minerals. The principles of this diet are to focus on more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains and legumes and heart healthy fats, while consuming less processed foods, added sugar, refined grains and alcohol. This study is known, or sorry, this diet is known to have a positive impact on reducing risk for chronic diseases that are associated with eye disease over time. While there are limited studies showing the positive effect of Mediterranean diet on eye disease, preliminary research is promising, and it could be a good practice with low risk for us to implement a new strategy to prevent our risk for eye disease. So in conclusion, <clears throat> the role of nutrition in the development and progression of eye disease is widely studied with several promising ongoing research projects. Certain vitamins, minerals, nutrients have been implicated in the pathogenesis of age-related eye diseases, such as vitamin A, C, E, carotenoids, omega-3 fatty acids, zinc, and selenium, as well as countless others not mentioned in today's discussion. Researchers support some supplementation of certain vitamins and minerals, but do highlight the proposed risks and risk of toxicity as well as other side effects. If you are looking to supplement with any vitamins and minerals, I urge you to talk with your medical provider first. Most researchers can agree that diets rich in fruits and vegetables will provide a wide array 
wide array of different vitamins and minerals with low risk to consumers. <clears throat> Therefore, the Mediterranean diet may be a good and easy alternative to prevention of age-related eye diseases, as well as the arid supplementation formulation if you fall within that narrow population risk. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So we're just going to take a few minutes to collect questions from the audience here and from the chat online, and then we will be back for the Q&A. Okay, so there were a few questions uh, that were related to insurance. So I'm not sure if uh, you're gonna be able to answer this, but um, I think this is for Dr. Goldberg. Uh, does Medicare cover the LAL procedure? Uh, yes, and so what's happened um, back in uh, 2004, uh, CMS, which is the medical covering body uh, that works with Medicare, recognized that a lot of these new technologies when they were coming out they weren't going to be able to afford everything if they kept continuing to cover it. So what has happened in um, some areas of uh, anterior segment surgery is there's been a separation, kind of like church and state are separate. The, the, uh, the surgeries can still be performed that are totally Medicare approved, and that's the standard surgery you saw in the first slide with the handheld device. Uh, but now some of these newer implants and these newer lasers uh, do have an additional amount that patients uh, usually have to pay out of pocket. But the insurance still does pay a significant amount of the procedure. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then somebody asked again about insurance, what insurance programs are acceptable, average cost, length of time to heal, and uh, somewhat functions. Yeah, I, I mean, we, uh, our practice works with most of the uh, insurances in the area. Uh, we have a sister office uh, that also works with the um, we, we also work, you know, obviously, since this is a torrent sponsored event with a lot of the FIPA HMO patients. Uh, there's another HMO, very prominent area, Optum, and we have another office that uh, sees those patients. So we really try to accommodate most insurances uh, within the area. Okay. Um, I have a question for Dr. Gasparini. Uh, how quickly do these eye diseases progress? Months, years? Are there genetic factors to consider in the development or progression of eye diseases? Um, so the first one in terms of diabetic retinopathy, it depends on what stage you are in the disease. If you have more of an advanced, uh, severe, non-proliferative disease, about 50% of, of patients can progress over the next year to proliferative disease. So it depends on what stage you are at. So the longer you have diabetes, the bigger the chance of getting diabetic retinopathy, but many people have just mild early disease that can take years to progress. It depends what stage you're at. The more advanced you are, the easier it is to progress. Oh, and then in terms of, uh, what was the second part of the question? I think, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, are there genetic factors to consider in development of progression? Um, you know, mainly when we think of genetics, we think of age-related macular degeneration. That is probably the biggest eye disease that has a genetic uh, predisposition. And there's certain genes that have been identified with different types of macular degeneration. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, or Dr. Goldberg again, there's several questions about cataract surgery. Uh, what kind of surgery should I have? What's the downtime? Yeah, you know, so it's, it's a, it really becomes a personal choice, uh, kind of to expect 
the, a typical patient comes in and presents usually with vision that uh, it's probably starting to compromise their night driving. That's usually the reason most people come in uh, or they're having trouble reading. Uh, most of us, uh, when a patient comes in, we'll do testing, um, like looking at the retina, and if that requires further work beyond our expertise, we'll refer you to Julie and her group. Um, we, we check everything out A to Z, and if your eye looks like a good candidate, and the cataract is really the primary issue while your vision's down, uh, we look to schedule, uh, we do one eye at a time, uh, in the great state of California, there's still more lawyers than priests, so we, we do, we follow the medical legal rules on that. There are some that are doing both eyes on the same day. There are some centers. We still are kind of traditional that way. So we do one eye, usually the second eye is two weeks later, and um, people do very well with that process. It's outpatient, um, similar to like going in for an endoscopy, You'll be there three hours, you'll get an IV in your arm, you're lightly sedated, the procedure itself only takes about 25 minutes, you'll be at the surgery center about three hours. We do it outpatient here at Torrance Memorial in their outpatient surgery center, and we have other private surgery centers in the community affiliated with Torrance Memorial. Um, the main one most um, anterior segment surgeons are going to is over on Crenshaw Boulevard at Torrance Surgery Center. And then we see you the next day in the office. Uh, you'll be on eye medication for about a month. Um, and most people have a very quick recovery, feel great the next day. Some people are seeing great the next day. Some people, it takes a couple weeks. And there's no right or wrong answer. Other things can happen, like dry eye and other things uh, along the way. But we'll, we'll help manage it with you to get you, get you to where you need to be. And along those lines, are there any new prescriptions for dry eye? Uh, there are. So uh, dry eye is multifactorial. Um, you know, there are many causes that contribute to it. Some of the effect is just due to uh, not adequate moisture on the eye. Some of it is due to a bacteria buildup in the eyelashes. Um, and some of it is due to, you know, we, we tend to think of a our dry eye in a vacuum, but the reality is, you know, if you're taking other medication, these systemic medicines do have an effect on your body. So if you're taking for stuff for antidepressants, blood pressure, you know, uh, you have kidney disease, you're not, uh, uh, allergy medication, all these things contribute, uh, um, contact lens wear. So we kind of sometimes really have to break down and look at everything, but um, out there now, uh, most patients like to start with over-the-counter artificial tears. There are 80 different type, even I don't know which one's better, but I, I, there's certain ones that you know are good. Um, I like refresh and sustain and retain. I think those are pretty tried and true. Um, there's been a lot of bad press about some that caused issues with um, infections, and there was also a concern about uh, like a Walgreens and a CVS brand. I think all the bad stuff has been removed from the market, so I want to reassure everybody on that. But there are now about four or five prescription medications on the market for dry eye. Most commonly uh, prescribed is Restasis. Its, tr it's um, medical name is uh, Cyclosporin. Uh, there's also one called Zydra, there's one called Sequa, there's a nasal spray called Trevia, and Bausenlam just released a new one that's a waterless eye drop. It's a, it's a fascinating, it's like a petroleum uh, a fluorocarbon, it's a non-water eye drop, but uh, some people really like the effects of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go over to a question uh, for Hannah, our dietitian. Uh, great presentation, very informative and well put together. Is there any other diet or dietary recommendations you would recommend aside from the Mediterranean diet? I would say just practicing a diet that is well balanced, high in fruits and vegetables, but more so with a variety of fruits and vegetables. When we really focus on only a small variety, we're really limiting ourselves to a lot of different vitamins and minerals. Every different plant-based food, as well as protein-based food, is very rich in its array of vitamins and minerals with a unique composition of 
vitamins and minerals as well. So if you're not one for following a Mediterranean-based diet, that's okay. Look to make small changes in ways we can increase our dietary variety of plant-based foods and also different protein foods such as fish and lean proteins. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions for Dr. Gasparini. Um, what is the experience in the treatment of posterior vitreo detachment? So um, posterior vitreous detachment is one of the most common things I see in my office. So that's when the gel that's in the eye starts liquefying as we get older and it can shrink and separate from the back of the eye as a normal process of aging. And it can cause in some patients acute floaters and flashing lights. And if it pulls hard enough on the retina, it can tear the retina, and that's what causes a retinal detachment, which is then a surgical emergency and requires surgery in the operating room in most cases. Um, so that's a very common thing we treat as retina specialists. But the vitreous itself, uh, most patients over time, the symptoms become less uh, bothersome, and either you know, for most people, they, they go away or at least their brain learns to ignore them and they're not as bothered by them. Um, also along those lines, wondering if a vitrectomy uh, increases the risk of cataracts. That's a great question. It, it does increase the risk of cataracts. The vitreous acts as an oxygen sink and when you remove the vitreous from the eye, we leave a balanced salt solution in the eye, but the front of the eye is producing a clear aqueous fluid that's constantly being produced and drained out of the eye, and, and it just fills the whole eye with that. But because the, the vitreous acts as an oxygen sink, people will get premature cataract formation. So um, most patients that have a vitrectomy will need cataract surgery within six to 12 months. And so thank goodness we have people like Dr. Goldberg to take care of that. <laughs> okay, and then some general questions. Uh, at what point do I see an ophthalmologist when after seeing an optometrist for vision correction, but not satisfied with my corrected lenses? So what I would say is, you know, it, it, it can be difficult on that question to know totally why the patient wasn't 100% satisfied with an optometrist. The great thing is there are so many great optometrists in the community that a, a lot of patients have great relationships with them. And if you feel it's working well, by all means, you know, keep seeing them annually. I think if, the, if your medical situation is one where the optometrist thinks your uh, level of care needs to be upgraded, they're usually pretty uh, honest with, uh, you know, the patient to say, listen, I think something more is going on and you need to now see an ophthalmologist, you're always welcome to come in for a second opinion and we can, you know, reconfirm what optometrists, um, you know, think they're do achieving with glasses or not. Um, I guess the question be just becomes is, is it, if it's an age issue and the patient's been informed that they have a cataract but they can get by with glasses, sometimes patients get frustrated that the glasses still can't achieve the vision they want. That's one reason we see people come in. Another time it's, it's you know, the glasses are accurate, but the patient is really also struggling with dry eye. Um, and that's usually more the medical condition that we all try to, um, you know, manage. Or if there's something further going on with the retina, and we'll refer, refer you up the food chain to Dr. Gasparini. Okay, another uh, lifestyle question. Recommended time for device use, close up, medium, and distance. Yeah, you know, so this is an interesting question. They're, they're, you know, we still really don't know. You know, there's really not good evidence saying, you know, we know, you know, we have our opinion on, you know, social media, but um, there was a large study done about three years ago, not necessarily in terms of time on the device, but it was blue light bad. People were worried, did, did we need blue light glasses? And the reality is the study showed there was no evidence that blue light glasses helped. 
the issue that people, that the study de determined was it was dry eye and bacteria overgrowth from the lashes that were causing the um, irritation with being on computer screens. I don't, it's, it's a difficult long study to prove out. We will do it at some point, but I, I don't think we have a good answer yet. Unless... I completely agree with that. I think I second what Damien just said. All right. Um, I have a, num a lot of questions here, so I'm going to try to uh, uh, rapid fire some of them. But um, another lifestyle. What is the purpose of the veggie shot? This is for Hannah. There are a lot of different supplements on the I market. I think that's for Hannah, right? Yeah, I don't know. I so. <laughs> um, I'm not so familiar with a veggie shot in particular, whether this is applied orally or subcutaneously. Most, I suspect, like a little oral shot. Um, that might have a concentration of different juices rendered from different vegetables. So supplementing with vitamin and mineral or, or vegetable and fruit products that don't come from the whole fruit and vegetable product is only like taking a small piece of the picture. The whole fruit and vegetable is definitely recommended over the intake of different supplements such as reds and greens powders, different shots, or different types of you know, highly processed supplement foods. Because that whole product contains 100% of the naturally occurring vitamins, minerals, and fibers. Um, rather than jumping straight to a supplement, I'd really try to focus on small ways in which we can increase our intake of fruits and vegetables, but also whole grains and other different plant-based foods, as well as those vitamin and mineral rich protein foods such as beef and salmon, but looking at those lean options as well. Okay, um, moving on. Um, if a lens can be changed with light, won't exposure to sunlight change it? Great question. Yes, that is a good question. So one thing I didn't get really get into the nitty gritty on with the light adjustable lens is yes, it can. Part of the healing process, once the implant is implanted in the eye, and when I say implant, I'm talking about the light adjustable lens, it's uh, mandatory for patients to wear specialized sunglasses while outside uh, to protect against sunlight. There is now a filter uh, built into the implant, and this was one of the reasons why we waited on the technology. It did come out three years. We acquired it this year. There's now a filter on the implant that protects against room light. So you don't need to wear any special glasses while indoors, but outdoors there is a certain wave light frequency that can affect the lens that could move the shift the lens while you're outside prior to the doctor fine tuning and titrating it. So we do recommend specialized and we will provide them free of charge these specialized sunglasses when a patient gets the light adjustable lens. But and all all providers who are using this technology do the same. And so once it's adjusted though it's adjusted and yeah, so there, there are usually three to four adjustments, and then there are two lock-ins. And then once the lock-ins are performed, the lens is back to a static lens and won't be flexible anymore, and patients can resume normal lifestyles without sunglasses outside. Okay, great. And that's usually performed at about one month to two months after the procedure. Great question. Thank you. Um, okay, another question. If the LAL was only tested for eight years before it was used, how can we be assured that the lens will not change for 20 plus years after the final light adjustment and procedure to set the lens? Fair question. The reality is I was in the clinical trial eight years ago. This technology, believe it or not, has been in the works since the late 80s. It's died and reborn and died and reborn. And so there have been a, several attempts to finally bring it to the market. So this is like the little engine that could it finally, the right team came together to be able to deliver it. Reality is we don't know. Uh, but what I would say is we know implants have very good uh, longevity. I mean, implants have been going into eyes since World War II. 
that's how we figured out that a, a artificial implant could be put in the eye. Um, the difference just is we've never had an implant that we could change and then lock. And I don't see any reason to believe the implant itself would change its flexibility again. The material of the light adjustable is made of silicone. Silicone has been widely used for decades in eyes. The two most common uh, materials used for implants are acrylic, a clear acrylic, and silicone. And again, we've had millions of implants put in. So I, I, I believe uh, this will be pretty, um, you know, th this will be here to stay until something new truly changes the field. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right. Oh. Yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, what? So, so repeat the question. Yeah, let's repeat the question. If it didn't last, could a second operation be performed? So usually surgeries are very straightforward and, and outcomes are extraordinary. Things can happen to nice people. There can be complications of the surgery and people can get into accidents and implants often sometimes get dislocated or moved or broken. And it's common practice for all of us to be able to go back in and exchange the lens if there's a problem. Um, and that, that's readily done. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Goldberg, would you recommend monovision uh, lens implants in order to have full range of vision? And would I still need glasses to see middle range? And if a distance lens is inserted for cataract surgery, can nearsightedness still be corrected with glasses? So monovision and yeah. Distance. Let's so basically, we can really do whatever you want. You know, we now have implants that can give each eye everything with the trade off of contrast loss or halos. That was some of the multifocal implants I was showing earlier in the presentation. We have the ability to just set you really good for distance, and then you can use any type of glasses you want to correct for intermediate or near vision. And we can go the other direction, set your eyes good for reading. Some people who've done this in contacts before like the strategy of what's called monovision. So what is monovision? Monovision is where you set one eye really for distance and you choose to make another eye, usually your less dominant eye, set for up close vision. And some people want computer vision or intermediate. Or some people want near. And you really can do anything. Now, if you've never done monovision before, I strongly recommend you do a quick trial in contact lenses before you say, operate on my eyes and make me monovision. <laughs> because it can work, and some people hate it. So we always like to dip the toe in the water before we uh, you know, commit to anything permanently. But we really can do anything. It's just, what do you want? Okay, great. Um, is there a way to reduce the possibility of floaters after surgery? And is it common to develop a film over your eye after cataract surgery? So, uh, yes and yes, and no and no. Um, the reality is we all have this jelly that Dr. Gasparini was talking about in the back called the vitreous. And as we age, it goes from a creamy ball of peanut butter a nutty peanut butter uh, or a snow globe. And Dr. Gasparini and I cannot change the aging process. That just happens. Sometimes what happens after cataract surgery is we turn the lights back on. All this light is coming back in there. And that is showing you, whether you like it or not, all the dust and cobwebs that are in the other parts of the eye. And it can be startling and disappointing and shocking, but truthfully, over just a few weeks to months, uh, the brain is the most amazing organ. It's so accommodating, and it learns to really filter out what's important and keep what's not. And over a few weeks to months, most people don't notice those floaters as much. However, 
every year I have one to five people who just can't stand it. And then I refer them to Dr. Gasparini and she does a procedure to get it out. Another thing that commonly happens is when we, as you may recall, maybe don't recall in the slides, so when we do cataract surgery, the cataract, the lens is really like a glass M&M. We take the chocolate out, we leave the candy shell, and we put new chocolate in. That's, that's what I do. I'm an M&M engineer. But the candy shell, over time, will fibrose. It will get cloudy. And that's the film which you were speaking about. And that will happen almost with certainty, like death and taxes. I don't know when it's going to happen, but when it does, the good news is we have a technology in our office, every um, anterior segment surgeon does, that can polish it. It's a one-time thing, and you're on your way. Okay, another one. I have nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, but no cataract. I'm 67 years old. What type of lens replacement is best? So if you're 67, you have a cataract. You just haven't realized it yet. <laughs> okay, let me be the first to tell you the good news. Because you're wearing reading glasses. And if you're wearing reading glasses, the process has started. Now, if you still have great vision with glasses, I don't think you should do anything. I think you should sit tight. But if you can't stand the glasses and you're seeking a solution to get out of glasses, there is an option with what we call clear lens exchange, where we're doing the surgery maybe a little bit before your cataract is visually impairing your vision. It's essentially the same thing. It's just you're fitting the whole bill because your insurance won't pay for the aspect that typically is covered by insurance. So you become a candidate if you want to get out of the glasses for all the same options we uh, talk about with patients who have cataract surgery. We could set your eye good for distance. We could do monovision. We could set up your eyes for distance and near with the multifocals. Um, the world's your oyster. Um, if laser cataract surgery is the preferred method, why does Medicare not cover this? You know, it's not so much a word. We can't really use the word preferred. It's just the reality is the data still shows, um, you know, you're probably going to have less issues with pursuing laser, but many surgeons still, I'd say 80%, do handheld surgery, okay? Um, so I think it's just, again, you got to look at it as it's the way healthcare is changing and some things in our great system are going to be covered and some things aren't. Okay, question for Dr. Gasparini. Do you need to see an ophthalmologist to receive a diabetic eye exam and once you have retinopathy, can it be reversed? Those are good questions. So we do recommend a dilated eye exam. It doesn't have to be by an ophthalmologist. It can be by an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, but a dilated eye exam where you're looking at the back of the eye um, is important. They do have some screening photography now as well that can capture a large portion of the eye that can be used for um, screening diabetic eye exams as well. So it's more important about getting the retina checked rather than, and it typically optometrists, if they see diabetic retinopathy, then they'll refer them on to a retina specialist for monitoring or treatment, whatever is indicated for that particular patient. Um, in regards to reversing diabetic retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy can improve if there's better blood sugar um, control, so we can see improvements in diabetic retinopathy, yes. Um. Can you please address how to get rid of, I'm not sure if uh, I'm going to say this right, pinnacula? No, pin, does yeah. that sound right? Uh, and the pros and cons. Pinguaculum uh, and pterygium. Okay, and so how a, long does it take to recover? A common um, external eye presentation that happens in areas like Los Angeles, where we get a lot of sunshine, 
It's really the sun, sun, sunshine states or countries close to the equator. UV light bounces off our nose, which is like a giant mirror, and we're the only species on planet Earth where the UV light hits the stem cells just on the inside of our iris in an area called the limbal stem cells. And these are the cells responsible for the growth of your skin that covers the white part of your eye called the conjunctiva. And what occurs is you start getting unregulated growth on either on the inside of your uh, pupil or the outside of your pupil and people form these elevated bumps. And so when it's a bump just on the white part of the eye, it's called a pinguiculum. And when it's a bump that grows onto the actual front glass surface of the eye, or sorry, not glass, the cornea, the clear part, we call it a pterygium. So um, for, for the best thing is prevention, just kind of like what we spoke about with some of the other diseases with diabetes and health. And so the best way to prevent it is sunglasses and a hat. But if these uh, elevations have formed, sometimes we have to remove them. We currently are involved in a clinical trial of a uh, phase two medication to try to shrink them. And there is research continuing to be done on maybe coming up with eye medication to um, uh, uh, get rid of them. But still, right now, the only method is uh, surgical removal. They are not fraught with easy removal um, if the pterygium is really significant and has a lot of um, uh, blood vessels in it. Recurrence of, uh, after it's been removed can be one out of three. So it's something you really have to weigh. We, we have successfully removed them, but there, it is sometimes a little bit of a crapshoot. They're not, there's no uh, morbidity associated with them in terms of, you know, um, it's bad for your health. It just can be uncomfortable and cause dry eye. Sometimes it affects vision. Okay, sorry, I have a number of specific questions. Um, uh, one more general, do certain prescribed eye drops help with glaucoma? Yeah, there, there, there are probably, gosh, how many, 20? There are, there are more than 10, less than 100 <laughs> medicated eye drops out on the market now to lower the pressure uh, for people who have glaucoma. And glaucoma is a disease where the eye pressure is too high for the uh, existence of the nerves, and it causes damage of the nerves in the back of the retina. So it's really important that we uh, regulate the eye pressure just like we have to regulate uh, blood pressure. Okay, and can you become blind during or after cataract surgery? It's pretty unlikely, but anything can happen. Um, you know, the, the outcomes of the surgery are pretty high yield. And I, what I tell people is we are, we're, we're good surgeons, we're not Harry Potters, and we can make most things go really well. The most important thing is don't run for the hills. So if something is not going right with your post-operative experience, although you may hate my guts, come back in, because I can get you to the right person like Dr. Gasparini or other doctors, and we can pretty much correct most things. But if you disappear, that's when we get into trouble. Okay, so I think we're running out of time, so we're going to cut it there. There are a few more questions, but if you, they're very specific, so if you want to ask questions of any of the presenters, please feel free to do that, but we, um, it is time to wrap up, so we will do that. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and I hope you uh, continue to enjoy the Miracle of Living lecture series. And again, thank you for being here, everyone who's online and in person. And please fill out the um, forms for the uh, uh, critique of the series. Thank you.